Good afternoon. My name is Giovanna Gennard, and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Strategic Communication and Marketing at Old Dominion University. On behalf of ODU's Reyes Virtual STEM Program, I would like to welcome you to our panel titled Learning Trajectories in Undergraduate Research. In this panel, you will hear how undergraduate research enhanced the learning experience of former Perry Honors College students and impacted their lives after graduation. At the end of your presentations, I will facilitate an interactive Q&A session. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask the presenters, please submit them online throughout the session. Joining us today are Dr. David Metzger, Dean of the Perry Honors College, and our moderator, Eddie Hill, Director of Undergraduate Research and Associate Professor in Human Movement Sciences, as well as ODU alumni, Angelos Angelopoulos, Elena Roman, Jasmine Carmen, and Jeremiah Ammons. Dr. Hill, the panel is in your good hands. Well, thank you all for joining us today. We're very, very excited to um, have these four students uh, share with you their, um, what they did for their research and how it's impacted them um, currently and then for their future. So we're very excited moving forward. We have four wonderful speakers, um, as uh, was mentioned earlier. I'm gonna give you a brief background on each of these students, and then I'm gonna turn it over in a, the same order to allow them to present. At the very end of all four presentations, we will have a time for questions and answers. Our first presenter will be Angelos. Angelos is a computer science major. He was recently awarded the Provost Outstanding Undergraduate Researcher for 2020, which is a fa fantastic honor. Our second presenter will be Elena. Elena is majoring in cybersecurity. Uh, Elena just graduated of the BS in, in May of 2019, and is currently working for an information system security engineer for the US Navy. Jeremiah is currently a psychology major. Uh, Jeremiah is continuing his education to explore a master's program in psychology at ODU with a concentration in human factor psychology. And finally, and the last but not least, our fourth presenter will be Jasmine. Jasmine is studying biology. Jasmine has co-authored multiple publications as an undergraduate, and it plans on applying to medical school to employ her medical uh, interest long-term. At this point, I'm gonna turn over to our first presenter, Angelos. I'm gonna share my screen, and then Angelos, I'm gonna have you to make it easier. You can just cue me in moving forward, and that way it will allow me to, let, to, to, to toggle as you need to do so. Okay, can you hear me all right? You hear great, yes, Angelos, yep. All right. Okay. Okay. So we'll be letting you know to move slides, right? So you can just give me a thumbs up if you want, and I'll move forward. Okay. Sounds good then. All right. So hello, everyone. I hope that you're all doing well. Um, it has been a while, you know, seeing some people <laughs> through all this time. Um, but my project has been uh, predict predicting particle trajectories and classifying them using machine learning. This was a collaborative project between uh, the Center for Real-Time Computing, which is uh, one of the biggest research groups in the computer science department, as well as Jefferson Lab, which is, a, let's say, a physics laboratory up in Newport News. Um, and let's start with the brief introduction of what was, you know, the, the background of the project. So the class 12 detector at Jefferson Lab is used to study the structure of matter, and it does so by scattering an electron beam of a proton target. That basically means shooting an electron beam and when it hits a proton, uh, particles of it, you know, are scattered. Now, uh, particles that, you know, that are scattered are detected by the signals that they leave in uh, the wire drift chambers. Now, the wire drift chambers, each, of, uh, each chamber has six layers and each layer has six wires. And every, every wire has 112 sensors. So in total, for every chamber, we have 4,032 sensors. So 4,032 positions that a particle can, you know, activate. Uh, and it is activated once a particle passes over it. And on the right, you can see, you know, if, if you're what this detector looks like, it is pretty big. And you can also see a person in purple there. Uh, so you have a sense of scale. Next slide. So the problem that we were encountering is uh, constructing these trajectories from experiments is expensive and also time consuming. So we need to consider all the possible combinations of segments or sensors that can make up a trajectory. So, and we only want to keep the one that most closely matches a line. So a line or some kind of curve, uh, but approximates a line in every circumstance. Uh, because this is expensive, this is an expensive combinatorics problem. We want a faster and more reliable method 
to identify these valid trajectories. And you know, speed is very crucial in the exper experimental pipeline. Next. So the solution to that was machine learning. So we developed machine learning models that can classify this incoming data with high throughput, because as I said, speed was a main goal of this. Uh, and the solution we came up with consists of two components, prediction of trajectories based on previous trajectory information. So you can think um, completing a trajectory based on some previous tracks, uh, and also classifying trajectories as being valid. So a valid trajectory will be an approximate line. Um, next slide. So I said the first component was predicting trajectories. And for this, we developed a recurring neural network using a, a gator recurring uh, using gate recurring unit layers, also known as GRU. Uh, now, the point here is that this network is only trained on valid trajectories. So it only knows how to complete valid trajectories. So what happens if you give it an, an invalid trajectory? Well, it will try to treat it as a valid one. Now, the result is that the prediction it will make will be wrong. And as you can see on the right, you can see on the top two purple uh, uh, you know, segments there, uh, a valid trajectory. So the yellow one is an actual trajectory, and the blue one is a predicted one. So on the top, you can see that the, the predictions were pretty, pretty, pretty close to the actual one. And this is because these are actually valid trajectories. So the bottom one, the model tried to, to you know, treat this as a valid trajectory, but it failed. So as you can see, the, the yellow one compared to the blue one is pretty far away. And this way, we can use this to try to determine if a trajectory is valid or not before even classifying it. So this is a first step filtering process. Um, yeah, so the results out of this is that on average, we got a mean absolute error of 1.18. This means that our predictions were about 1.18 sensors away uh, from the actual prediction in a valid sample. Um, and you know, for every sample, it takes about 688 microseconds, which is 0.6 milliseconds. Next, please. Now, the next component was classifying these trajectories. And we developed three different models, extremely randomized trees, a multi-layer perceptron, which is a standard neural network, as well as a convolutional neural network. Um, this was trained on thousands of tens of thousands of trajectory samples. And each sample uh, included multiple trajectories, of, of which only one was valid. Uh, and basically, the, the whole point of these models are to say, given a trajectory, if this is valid or not. As you can see on the right, you see you know, a chamber and a lot of different sensor activations. In this case, there is only one valid trajectory, which is the one that is marked in the green box. As you can see, all the other ones do not form a line from beginning to end in one of these boxes that contain uh, these sensors. All right, next, please. So we used uh, four different metrics to determine the accuracy of uh, the classification. The first one is the percentage of samples where we found the valid trajectory. Um, the second is the percentage of those samples, the A1 samples, for which there were also invalid tracks, which we said they're valid, so false positives. Uh, the other metric, AH, is the percentage also of A1 in which the valid trajectory had the highest probability of being valid. So the model actually gives a probability in each track in a sample if it's valid or not. And this metric basically says if the valid track is also the highest, probable, the highest probability track uh, of being valid. Uh, and lastly, AF is the percentage of samples where we did not find of the valid trajectory. And this was crucial for us to minimize because we don't want to miss any valid trajectories. And these are also known as false negatives, AF. All right, and here you can see a summary of the three models and the, the accuracy they achieved. So A1 is an important match. That means the percent of samples were asked to find the valid trajectory. For the MLP, which is the multi-layer perception, we got 96% accuracy out of 29,000 samples consisting of 291,000 uh, tracks in total. Uh, so, as you can see, the MLP and ERT, which is extremely randomized trees, the ERT got 100% 100 accuracy, whereas the MLP got 99.96%. Uh, we also use the CNN, but the problem with the CNN is that it's slow. It's approximately 10 times slower than the MLP, so we decided not to move forward with it, but it was an interesting, you know, experiment here. Um, and, yeah, so in conclusion, the models that we make have high accuracy and throughput, which is crucial for these experiments with class 12. And by employing them in the pipeline, physicists can save six times more six times more time and energy compared to current trajectory filtering methods. And ultimately, this helps increase the accuracy of experiments. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Angelo. So that was great. Um, as I mentioned, our second speaker, and then please hold your questions till the end for Angelos, as I'm sure you'll have some. Elena, uh, as I mentioned, is an undergraduate, was an undergraduate at Savage Security. She's going to share a little bit about um, artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, Elena, I will turn it over to you. Are you, Elena, are you with us? I believe she's muted. Elena, you need okay. to unmute. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Angelus. <laughs> um, all right, I'll start over. Um, my research is on the systematic analysis of AI or artificial intelligence and regulating terrorist content on social media ecosystems using FDNA, which is the functional dependency network analysis. It's a risk management tool often used in um, more like uh, computer networks, um, which we'll explain in the next slide. Just an overview. So a lot of people interact, a lot of uh, uh, in our time have social media accounts where users were submitting information, we're submitting data, we're interacting with others. And we all recognize that the environment online is severely different than the environment we have in the real world, I guess I should say. And we found through this research that we call it an ecosystem because it's more than what we see as users. It's not just us submitting data, it's us submitting data, uh, our data being interacting with other people's data algorithms changing what we see, what we feel. Um, you have the people who own the platform, you have the ethics, the legality behind it. You have, um, it's very interdisciplinary. It's a very big picture thing. It's not just a social media platform. How we do this, not just somewhere we go to post our feelings or thoughts and things like that. Um, and we're seeing how AI technology interacts with this kind of ecosystem. And we kind of were uh, trying to understand, is this technology ready? to be monitoring this type of ecosystem. And we use the FDNA tool, um, and then we also applied some cyber ethics and some other items to it. Um, and I'll show you that in the next slide. So this is an FDNA analysis of artificial intelligence. Um, this is centered around the idea that uh, artificial intelligence is specifically designed for social media. So um, the important part to take away from FDNA is the dependency. Uh, this is the, you can, take this uh, fundamental representation as a network. And we're trying to find the dependencies between these items that make up this ecosystem or network. And we're trying to find which ones are critical to um, artificial intelligence being um, a positive influence on social media. So if you take away an item such as ethics, can technology, can cyber terrorism, real world and social media aspects still thrive as well as artificial intelligence? Um, and most likely in that case, um, you're highly dependent on ethics in order to uh, manage and uh, manage a social media platform um, and which would affect the real world, which would affect cyber terrorism on social media platforms. And therefore ethics would be one of your critical points. So you just have to define these dependencies. And this is how we broke down such a complicated ecosystem. And we were able to sort out which components do we really need to look in and which components affect others more so than um, the next. And for uh, uh, FDNA, usually the next step would be to assign numerical values to each of these nodes or components and mathematically um, find which are your critical points in the network and which ones are your failure points. And the subsections that we've kind of decided on for the artificial in this situation is kind of our key points for our ecosystem that we're talking about. And then next slide. This was just a rundown of AI technology for those who aren't as familiar. It's a very uh, high level view of it. Um, so I specifically chose this kind of algorithm for AI. So uh, for AI that's used in social media. So you have input data, this could be a picture, an item of someone posts a picture of a cat. So AI will go through to regulate the content on the site. They'll say, okay, layer one representation pulls out that um, this picture has um, ears that are shaped 
a certain way, it has whiskers, fur, and it'll go through each of these layers and assign it a numeric weight. And each of these weights are then calculated and given a prediction at the end. And through an AI training cycle, it'll say, okay, this prediction, um, it calculated that this image of a cat's actually a dog. We'll go through the cycle again, they'll adjust the numeric weights of each of the layers until the AI achieves that of a cat. And that's why to others who don't understand the algorithm think that the AI actually recognizes that it's a cat. No, the AI doesn't. It recognizes that this image has calculated itself into a numeric value that represents the cat to it. It's not actually seeing a cat. So it does the same thing on these social media sites for um, they're implementing AI technology to identify different images, um, wording, um, just content in general that they find is inappropriate on their sites and they're using this to identify and pull it down. Go ahead and go next slide. Um, ethics was a huge part of our research. Uh, we were doing the ethical debate of what AI, um, what companies and what programs can use AI and the ethics of AI itself. We have uh, a lot of bias in programming. It's there's no appropriate way yet to add complex ethics to AI because it, AI does not uh, recognize anything further than what we put into it. So um, it can see the yes and no. It can see um, ones and zeros. This is a cat. This isn't a cat. Um, it can't see that I've said this was a cat, but it's not a cat. The complexity isn't there yet. Morals ourselves, we haven't really um, put ourselves in a position to really um, numerically put our complexity of our ethics into something of a program. And uh, the other thing with social media is it's an ecosystem. It's not only a ecosystem, but it's a cyber ecosystem. So the physical location of it is non-existent in, other than the sense of where servers and certain things reside in. So ethics, you're communicating with these people online and your ethics and your morals, your culture is gonna be completely different with those of um, those in another region. So how is AI supposed to decipher which ethics falls within what, um, that there's no good way for us to put it yet. So why are we implementing a tool that can't support what it's regulating? If we're using regulation to um, put morals and ethics and take out inappropriate behavior, but we know that AI can't support ethics yet, we're not really sure. And that's why we took a case study, if you move to the next slide. Um, we specifically examined Facebook, Facebook Live. Uh, when we first started this research, this was around the time the incident, uh, the Christchurch uh, Christ mosque shooting occurred. This was a live stream incident that uh, occurred on Facebook of a first person shooter um, attacking a church uh, in New Zealand. And uh, the big problem with this is not only did it take AI, the AI that Facebook has been promoting and saying it's regulating their site did not catch this. It uh, actually wasn't reported. It was reported by a user five minutes after the video finished. And then once it got through that cycle, then the police were notified and the police notified Facebook that this video had been streamed um, on their platform. So you see that there's a disconnect that they're using AI to regulate, but it's not being used appropriately. It's not doing the purpose that we're trying to serve. Um, I have this timeline on the side of other uh, Facebook incidents that have occurred um, over a live stream because AI can't detect it. They can't detect the difference between a first person shooter um, and an actual terror incident versus a video game. Um, again, like the cat, it, it, can, it doesn't see a cat, it sees the weight of a cat. It doesn't see that this person's creating a terror incident, it just sees it's the weight of a, what they equate to a video game, I assume at this point. Um, so our biggest takeaway from viewing this uh, Facebook study is what we're seeing that are using FDNA, we're seeing our critical points and we're seeing that we don't have the correct conditions and we don't understand the ecosystem enough of social media to be implementing AI technology just yet until we do some further development. And if you move to the next slide, we took our findings from that undergrad research into new undergrad research and I, uh, me and another partner um, designed Porous or a hostile online radicalization user simulation. This is where we simulated users on social, different social media platforms set to how you interact on social media platforms and use their political beliefs, behaviors, and other um, parameters to determine when, how long, and in what conditions uh, a user could endure until they hit a tipping point, which then would create a 
uh, terrorist incident um, because this is where a lot of our influences get. And that's just kind of how we've taken, we're going layer by layer and breaking down social media as an ecosystem and how we can better tweak AI um, to get more information about the ecosystem so we can then together AI to be part of that um, ecosystem. And then next slide is just about my overall experience um, doing undergrad research. As you can see, you kind of build it layer by layer and it, um, at the end, you create a network of individuals. I got to play with a lot of different disciplines and um, I continue to just move on layer to layer and kind of get deeper, more mathematical in my research, uh, as you can see. Um, so it's really, really exciting. And then the last slide's just mine and my uh, mentor's contact. Thank you guys. Thank you, Alana. That was fantastic. Very well done. Um, so next up, we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a psychology major and looking at consumer behavior. So I'm going to pull up Jeremiah's presentation for us. All right, Jeremiah, you are ready. Jeremiah, are you muted? All right, here we go. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hill. And I'd like to say uh, great work, Elena Angelos, before I start. Um, but my name is Jeremiah. Um, today I'll be talking to you guys about the effects of time pressure and user ratings on consumers' eye fixations. We could have next one. Uh, so the, this study was important because um, with the internet becoming increasingly popular, uh, consumers uh, tend to shop online more and make more online purchases. However, uh, consumers are more at risk because they can't physically grasp products, you know, to attest for its quality like they can in reality. Um, also, with time pressure being present from flash sales, holidays, etc., consumers are rushing while still trying to make their best purchase decisions possible. Uh, we go to the next slide. And so this study had uh, about six hypotheses, which were very interesting, but interesting means complex. So for time's sake, I'll just cover the two basic ones. Um, hypothesis one, uh, as user ratings on a product become greater, uh, we hypothesize that consumers average fixation length and count will increase. And also uh, with time pressure, consumers average fixation length and count will decrease per product. Go to the next one. Uh, so this study had 47 college students at ODU. Um, convenience sampling was used uh, because participants signed up via SONA. Uh, and upon completion of the study, participants received course credit in a psychology course of their choosing. We go to the next one. So the scenario at hand, uh, we presented college students with the purchasing task of browsing various items with various user ratings uh, and having them decide which, which item they wanted to purchase. And according to previous literature, it was found that uh, if a consumer is more familiar with a branded product over another, the consumer will prefer the familiar brand. So uh, in this study, we actually made all brand names fictitious to remove this bias. Uh, we can continue to the next one. So the IVs in the study were time pressure, uh, which was a between subjects design. Uh, there was two conditions, the absence of time pressure uh, and the presence of time pressure. User ratings was a within subjects design uh, with ratings one through five. And our DB uh, was consumer's average eye fixation. And I'd like to point out that brand names, product images, uh, sales being non-refundable, these were all constants in the study. We can go to the next one. So like I said uh, earlier, we created an online shopping webpage. It had different brands of the same products. Uh, there were five products displayed on the screen for trial for the participants to choose from and each product displayed a different user rating. Uh, we go to the next slide. This is an example of one of the purchasing screens. So we had them uh, purchase a beanbag chair. Uh, and of course, above the product, you see the fictitious brand names. Below the products, you have the user ratings, which are randomized. So it wouldn't just be one, two, three, four, five. Um, and as you can see, that little bubble, oh, <laughs> That little bubble allows them to uh, choose whichever product they want before continuing. And now we'll continue to the next one. So 
So uh, eye tracking, uh, it shows where consumers' attention is primarily focused uh, when shopping. Um, that picture at the top is actually the eye tracking device. You just mount it to the bottom of the uh, computer screen and it blends right in and tracks all gaze behavior. So we divided the screen into multiple uh, areas of interest as I'll show you on the next slide. But um, in each AOI, we measure consumers average fixation length, which was in milliseconds um, and fixation count, which is a gaze longer than 100 milliseconds in each AOI. <clears throat> and as you can see here, uh, there was five AOIs, and each AOI was the product, its brand name, and its user rating count. And again, in each AOI, we uh, accounted for fixation length, and it measured fixation count. And I like to point out that fixation length and count both represent sort of what where the consumer was paying the most attention. So an increased fixation length and count symbolizes what was important to the consumer. We can continue to the next slide. So we used a two by five mixed ANOVA to test uh, the effects in the study. We can go to the next one. I won't spend too much time on, on that. So here's the results. Uh, we actually found significant main effects of user ratings on fixation length. Uh, as you can see here in the uh, diagram, I know it's pretty hard to read right now, but uh, user ratings is on the X axis and fixation length is on the Y axis. And as you can see, as user ratings increases, uh, so does fixation and link, which was consistent with hypothesis one. We can continue. You'll see similar results with fixation count. Uh, there was a significant main effect of user ratings on fixation count. And again, in the diagram, um, as user ratings increase, so does fixation count. Which again, was consistent with hypothesis one. So what does this mean? Uh, this shows that individuals placed more attention on products with a greater user rating. Um, and it could also be assumed that ratings one and two were viewed as poor. Um, and ratings three, four, and five may have been more worth considering uh, due to the increased fixation length and count over the latter ratings. And this was determined by pairwise comparisons, if you know what that means. Now let's look at time pressure on fixation length. Um, we found significant main effects of time pressure on fixation length. Uh, and it was found that participants in the time pressure absence condition had longer fixation lengths than those in the time pressure presence condition. As you can see here in the um, chart below, uh, in the absence condition, fixation lengths were up to 609 milliseconds, while the presence condition, uh, they were down at 353 milliseconds, uh, which was consistent with hypothesis two. We continue. And you'll also see uh, similar findings again here. So there was a significant main effect of time pressure or fixation count. Uh, participants in the time pressure absence condition had significantly greater uh, fixation counts than those in the presence condition. As you can see in the chart, uh, absence condition, there was a 19.28 uh, average for fixation count while presence was down to two. And I will explain what this means here. So, oh, we go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so this shows that individuals, uh, they may have adopted heuristics that allowed them to make an informed decision faster while under time pressure uh, without needing to consume as much browsing time as they did in the uh, absence condition. Thank you. So wrapping it up, uh, some limitations of this study. Uh, it did not appear, as you can see, as a real web page, you know, with ads and related items on the screen. Uh, but this was mainly because we didn't want to uh, take any of the eye track would have captured uh, their gazes in those domains, and we didn't we didn't really want that. Also, due to COVID nineteen, uh, we were not able to fulfill the fifty uh, participant requirement assessed by G Power. Also, visual saliency was not assessed in the study. If you know if, if you don't know what visual saliency is, it's how an object's location or appearance on the screen can att can attract someone's attention. We can continue. So future research could uh, be done by including sample sizes next to user ratings uh, to see how that might affect consumers' uh, behavior. For example, if a product had five stars, uh, but only four people rated it over a product with four stars, but 100 plus people rated it, uh, you know, that may skew a decision and that might be important to look at. And with that being said, uh, thank you for your time.
Great. So we have uh, one more presenter now before we move to Q&A period. That's going to be Jasmine. As I mentioned, Jasmine was a biology major, much like uh, Elena. She graduated last year and is now pursuing medical school. Let me pull up Jasmine's presentation for us and we'll turn the floor over to her. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the research that I uh, present, am presenting was carried out at Marshall University Jones C. Edwards School of Medicine. It was in the um, summer research internship for minority students. The overall um, publication that I will be speaking about is called uh, Metabolic Syndrome and Salt Sensitive Hypertension in Polygenic Obese Tallyho JJ Mice and its role of the sodium potassium signaling or sodium potassium pump. So during this uh, research opportunity, we were studying the connection between a high salt diet and uh, kidney function. So as you all know that obesity is a growing problem in America and is a, a very bad problem in West Virginia where John C. Edwards is located. So we were looking for the connection of uh, feeding a high salt diet to the Tally Hope uh, polygenic mice. Basically these mice were chosen because they, uh, mod they model <laughs> Basically, these advice were chosen because they model the uh, body system of an obese human being. They have been found to be very closely um, related in terms of the amount of fat content that they are able to produce when they are fed the high salt diet. So more specifically, we looked into, when I was focusing on my private research, under um, Dr. Yan at this lab, I looked into the connection of interleukin-6 and the sodium potassium pump. Interleukin-6 is an inflammatory cytokine that in, induces uh, reacts to oxygen species. So we assume that if an individual had a high fat content or the mouse had a high fat, fat content, there would be um, a raised amount of interleukin-6 within their uh, Western blotting data. So um, the sodium potassium pump is located in the renal proximal tubule within the nephron of the kidney. This, um, the, proximal, the proximal tubule filters about 67% of sodium and water uh, throughout the kidney. And this mechanism is not fully understood and its connection is very intricate to um, obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and of course, uh, cardiac issues. Next slide, please. So I studied the interleukin-6 pathway to figure out exactly how interleukin-6 could be involved in this process. Um, as you can see in this model, uh, we have um, the interaction of reactive oxygen species and the sodium potassium pump. We're trying to understand how these negative interactions would, increase, would decrease sodium excretion and increase urine output. Next slide, please. So for my experiment, I actually focused more so in the animal lab, which is fun. Um, my... Uh, main duties during this time while I was in West Virginia was to weigh the mice, take their blood pressure, and take their blood sugar. So I also administered the high salt diet uh, when the mice were about uh, 14 weeks of age. So my control model was the B6 mouse, who is generally a healthy mouse that's small, very feisty, normal mouse that you would see, while the tally hole mouse is lazy, really, really fluffy, huge. <laughs> and so as I, next slide, please. As I began comparing the mice and continuously feeding them the high salt diet, it was identified that the tally hole mice were growing 
at an exceptional rate. They had high, a higher body weight and higher blood pressure. Next slide, please. So now we get more into the uh, markers in response to the high salt diet. So as you can see here, I have the B6 mice and the tally home mice both on screen. So NC means normal culture and HS means high salt diet. Um, the normal culture basically displays that there isn't a, a high amount of protein and gene expression. However, once you move into the high salt diet, you see um, heavy inflammatory markers, especially in the tally home mice. It was normal to see a slight raise in the normal culture of tally home mice because they are genetically um, sensitive to um, high fat content and eliciting um, a high salt response. Next slide, please. So as we move forward into the reactive oxygen species effects on the sodium potassium signaling, we uh, realize that there are strong connections between a uh, raised effect of reactive oxygen species in the tally home mice, as well as overactive sodium ATK signaling in tally home mice, which influences a large urine output. Next slide, please. So in terms of the urine output of the mice, so it, it was found that these mice, of course, have a higher urine output and they were more prone to um, kidney disease or fatty kidney, diabetes, and they also require a higher food consumption. And they weren't as thirsty as well. So this was all um, the quantitative data over this seven day period with different um, foods of different salinities. Next slide, please. So um, in my specific research, while I was still on their campus, we realized that the inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6 is involved in this process. However, we have not yet identified the extent it is involved. However, we noticed that there are inflammatory mechanisms that can possibly be mediated amongst um, obese mice that hopefully would be used for future advances. Next slide, please. So um, obviously we further study the relationship between the sodium, potassium, ATP, and IL-6 signaling pathway. Um, the Research is currently moving forward at Josie Edwards. We are hoping to move forward into potential um, human trials and um, hopefully another university will pick it up that has a bigger animal lab so that we will go through the necessary steps to um, study the relationship between obesity, hypertension, and interleukin-6 and other inflammatory cells. Next slide, please. So this is just my acknowledgement of people who helped me throughout the experiment and the uh, trials. Hold on. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Jasmine. That was quite impressive. Very, very well done. Excellent. Um, I just want to commend all four of you for a really outstanding presentation. I need to go and do some homework to ask some really great questions, I realize now. So um, I will, uh, at this point, turn it back over to ABP Gennar to see uh, we're proceeding forward with questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Hill and panelists. Your presentations were excellent. Thank you for your research and for the knowledge that you shared with us today. So I now want to encourage all of the greatest participants to go ahead and feel free to submit your questions online, and we will um, be able to answer as many as we can, given our time. But I do have a first question for the panelists, and this one is uh, for Jasmine. I was curious to know how the undergraduate research experience helped you in your career or your goals after graduation. Okay, so with me specifically, um, this particular research opportunity encouraged my um, desire to work with minorities and rural populations as far as nutrition. So as a result, I'm now pursuing a master's in public health in nutrition. So I would say it taught me different aspects of health that 
I will, of course, we all learn about um, healthy foods and such things such as that, but I was able to learn about a greater connection in improving the human body. And as an undergraduate student, how did you first get the opportunity to pursue research or how, what, what steps did you take to make sure that you had those, those experiences? With this opportunity, a professor, um, Professor Douglas Mills, had emailed the whole class asking us to apply for this opportunity. And it seems that I was the only one who decided I wanted to apply. So um, I definitely believe in the connection between professors and mentors at ODU. That's great. Thank you for that. And Jeremiah, what about you? How did your undergraduate research prepare you for life after graduation? Uh, right, for sure. Um, well, first, it let me master APA format because there was a lot of that about this. But uh, I think it gave me a new mentality for the future uh, because now, you know, like I've done it. So I see like I have what it takes because it, it really is uh, it's a great deal of work. So to know that I could complete it was uh, changing in my mentality. Thank you. And what opportunities, what did you do as an undergraduate student to try to find these opportunities? So any advice for future scientists or engineers who are going to be enrolling in college? If you can look right. back, what would you tell them to do? Um, to be honest, I applied for the Honors College because I really didn't uh, have a clue about undergraduate research, but uh, with the great advising staff over there, they recommended it to me and it struck my interest. Now here I am. Thank you. And Dr. Metzger, can you tell us more about the Honors College, please? Uh, thanks, Giovanna. The Honors College provides a, a four-year program for um, entering first-year students, but we also accept transfer students and students who somehow missed us when they were freshmen can apply as their OU students. I always say that there are three pillars to an honors education. There's undergraduate research, civic engagement, and leadership. And we offer special honors courses. Also, we provide uh, several grants and to uh, tuition scholarships to help students avail themselves of all the opportunities they have at ODU and I would say worldwide. And can you tell me about some examples in addition to the ones that these uh, wonderful alums have shared with us? What are some of the current research projects that some of the Honors College students are pursuing? Well, one of our um, courses that's only available to Honors College students is an undergraduate research apprenticeship at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Uh, so uh, in the spring, we had, um, despite uh, COVID restrictions at a, at a health facility, uh, we had a number of students doing uh, research. For example, once uh, we had one student who's a biology major who actually learned how to do uh, what's called um, microanalytic discourse analysis. On what and why on earth would you do that? Well, the study was to, to uh, see if it, you could, it would be possible to identify gender bias in the evaluation and recommendations of residents. That is, uh, and, uh, and, and I won't, won't tell you the results of that, but you could see why they were interested in that. I mean, it was simple. It was uh, taking, you know, where, you know, if you, if you like someone, uh, they might be um, uh, very straightforward and driven. But if you don't like someone, they're just aggressive jerks. Interesting. How those so perceptions, yep, yeah, how so, they work. And they were, and they were wanting to uh, identify uh, whether or not there might be a problem in terms of their evaluation. Uh, or a assessment of students in uh, medical school. And then once they identified whether or not there was a problem and were able to, in very specific ways, identify uh, a problem, if there were a, a problem, then they could develop a way to intervene and cr uh, create uh, a more hospitable and diverse uh, educational experience. That's really wonderful to hear because as part of the Global Reyes program, that really is our goal too. We really want to expose students from all backgrounds 
to under underrepresented students as well as majority students who talk about their research and their experiences to really encourage people to pursue those areas of study. So we really thank you for sharing that information. Um, and what about you, uh, Elena? Can you tell us more about what inspired you to pursue this research and how it helped you after graduation? Um, so what inspired me to do this research is uh, just being involved in my cyber community. Uh, uh, since the beginning, I joined the um, cybersecurity living murder community. I'm surrounded by cyber individuals all day. Um, I really, you just, you fall in love with the people you're around, the people, what they're doing. You hear about research they've got going on, professors share their research. Everyone's very um, passionate about what they do. And so it's hard not to fall into uh, being passionate as well. Um, I feel like that's a culture that kind of ODU has created. They're all passionate about what we do. And so it just makes you 10 times more passionate to get out there and do it yourself, um, which has always been great. And then, um, I've definitely taken the research I've done and not only just the research itself, but the connections you make, um, the principles you learn within the research, um, just how to communicate with others. I've been like taking that and been able to open a lot more doors. I mean, when I started college, I thought that's where I was going. Like if you asked me when I first started, if I'd be doing undergrad research. And, I mean, all these other opportunities are that I would have not agreed with you about ODU. Um, so I definitely think it's a great experience that uh, ODU offers you if you are, you yourself are out seeking it. It takes a lot of um, individual. I applaud everyone else who's done underground research. It's not something that it's very intimidating to start, but once you get into it, you can get out of it. So great. Well, thank you for that. That's wonderful. I appreciate you sharing that. And Dr. Hill, can you tell us what is a living and learning community and talk about um, what opportunities are available to students in the Honors College as well as other areas who would like to take advantage of these opportunities? Because from what I understand, a living and learning community also exposes you to the types of research that Elena was just talking about. Um, yeah, Dean Metzger, maybe to answer that better than I can, but they do the living and learning community do, it does allow you to um, kind of embrace the as kind of a, uh, I think Elena alluded to that 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 cultural piece as well. So it's not just the science behind or the areas of study, but also the different people that are doing those types of things. Um, so, and they're you know they they create a it's a small family, it's a small network, and it allows you to continue building off of that for the future. And maybe like Elena and others could speak to that. Some remain friends for quite some time beyond graduation because of the connections you had. But we're at the intellectual level, but also the social level too. That's really terrific. So basically, it's this whole idea that these learners who want to explore certain subjects or have an area of interest have an opportunity to live together in the residence hall, right? And then through that, they have an opportunity to work with faculty members as well as learn um, new pieces. So it sounds like it's really fundamental to not only the Honors College, but also for students who are interested in research in general and exploring lots of other topics. Anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Metzger? Uh, no, I, I actually, I loved um, Dr. Hill's uh, answer. I mean, sometimes uh, be, because it underscores that research isn't what you, you might um, see on a, a cartoon where you have somebody at, you know, in lab coats, so you may, uh, holding up test tubes, who knows what it might be full of and boiling it or, and all that. It actually is a team-based uh, effort. And so you not only uh, learn more about a particular subject area, it actually enlivens the, the work that you do in your classes because you can actually see the point. That's right. <laughs> and that is a good point. <laughs> All right. Well, we do have one question and I would like to ask this of Angela's. We have Luis Angel Vergara Ortiz, who's joining us from Hidalgo, Mexico. And his question is, thank you for your, pre well, he says, thank you for your presentations. They're quite good. How have all of these investigations helped all of you to improve your knowledge and get the tools to face the real world and society? So Angela's, what can you tell us about that? Well, let me, let me talk about how we did this research. So we follow the standard route of research proposal, we could bring the table, and then you know we got accepted, and then they came to us and they asked us that we have this problem. How can you solve it? So we said we can solve it. We did research, we worked with them, and we finally solved it. Which is a pretty standard way of you know carrying out your business in the real world. There's someone comes with you a problem, you try to solve it. 
at least in my field. And also by, you know, communicating and uh, interacting with these people, these clients, you could say, and my coworkers, I'm the only undergrad in my lab, everyone else is PhD at this point. Uh, I actually learned a lot. Uh, I learned from them. I learned a lot, you know, about interpersonal relations, uh, how you work as a team, um, how you work by yourself, because a lot of times, you know, doing research can be a very individual effort. Uh, you have to you know, stay at home, you know, study, read, you know, work for long for long hours. Uh, so all this, I think, this uh, effort that I've, you know, I've put in has prepared me, you know, for you know the hardships that I will encounter in the future in graduate school as I will be, um, you know, pursuing a PhD. Um, and I think that it has been valuable. I mean, it's it's probably it's the best thing I did, you know so far in my undergraduate studies. And I don't regret it at all. <laughs> so I, re I recommend everyone, you know, go find professors you like, uh, talk to them, uh, say what you can bring to them. Uh, they will probably test you out. So this is how you can, you know, do what you want. So go to professors directly. Uh, don't wait to be asked, go to their offices, you know, knock the door <laughs> and get that position. That's great advice. And let's say um, that I'm somebody who is fairly shy and I'm not maybe as comfortable reaching out. What are some what are some tips that you have for that person? What are some things that you did so to to approach people and ask them for opportunities? And also, what if they said no at first? Did you keep persisting? And what happened with that? Yes. So if you're shy, I would say um, send an email so you don't have to go in person. Um, and if the professor has a problem, they will likely, you know, you know, try to ask you to solve it in one way uh, or, you know, try to show interest. So I think this is the first way to, you know, get your foot in the door. Like my lab, for example, had a lot of PhD students, so undergrads don't really go in too much. Um, so basically, I was given a hard problem uh, in the beginning and I solved it well and the professor liked me. So I was accepted in the lab. Um, so if 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 you get a no, I would say try to persist a bit more. But if you ultimately fail, there are other professors that you can approach. There there are many different professors doing a lot of different research. So it's I'm certain that you will find something. Certainly. <laughs> That's really great. Thank you. Can, can I add one thing? I just want to echo Please what Angelo said. I just I, I love how he said that so gracefully. Like approach your faculty as a faculty member. I love when students come to my office and ask about if you have some research or an idea. Just I mean. We're people, you know, we're, yeah, I think that's a really good recommend and do it as a freshman, do it earlier on. We had a student here at ODU who's recently graduated in um, electrical engineering, I think it was Michael Nielsen, who um, started as a freshman and went to a professor because he had a neat problem. It worked in for four years, had funding, has a great job and everything now because he started early. And But he went to his office and asked him because he got inspired by something that was said in class. So I, I love how you said that, Angelo, Angelos, and hopefully others will do that. It may be intimidating, but it's a great, um, it's a great, uh, uh, a task to accomplish is at least to go talk to someone or send them an email just if you feel less less uh, timid doing so. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that. And so I guess the answer is, you know, even if, if you're a freshman, like you said, in that lab that you applied for and um, they have other PhD students, so you still persisted and you were yes. able to test out and then you were able. So even if, even if right now it's a, we might be able to accommodate you later, just the point is don't give up, just keep on trying mm -hmm. and give yourself a chance to, you might, you might have that wonderful opportunity. And it sounds too like there's really a wealth of opportunities available to students. You just have to, like I said, take the courage to send that email or take that first step. Mm -hmm. Some people say that first step is the hardest, isn't that true? Yes, 100%. Really <laughs> um, and Jeremiah, can you tell us um, about some, let's say, some advice that you might have for students in terms of finding those opportunities? What would you recommend they do? And Jeremiah, if you're speaking, we can't hear you, so maybe unmute yourself. I'd keep doing there, that. <laughs> I, I was doing it too, no worries. <laughs> Uh, I would definitely recommend also, like you guys stated, if you are shy, um, the ODU's website is like super vital. Like you can just search like undergraduate research and so much information uh, is up there and you get so many new ideas and explore the labs that might interest you here at ODU. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Any other advice for prospective students or high schoolers who are interested in pursuing um, careers in sciences and, and definitely taking advantage of undergraduate research opportunities when they're in college? 
Is that for me or just anybody? Anyone. So if you'd like to answer it, go for it. Um, I can answer that question. I definitely think that students should be able um, should acknowledge that in this local area, there are a lot of opportunities that they should reach out to. Um, the, my spring semester of my senior year, I actually applied to um, the EBMS Summer Scholars Internship, and I received it. And that was um, basically just based on my previous research and the fact that I was reaching out, you know, like as far as any opportunity you're seeking for, make sure you stay on top of it and communicate with um, any administrators or research heads. And as far as individuals who are shy, I feel that if they are able to send in a, a letter, I've sent letters for shadow opportunities, or if they are willing to just email, eventually that'll break down barriers. So even if they don't want to walk up to a professor, they can send an email. <laughs> That's a great advice. Thank you. Anyone else? The only thing that I would add, that was great. That's exactly what I would have said and hope that others do, but um, it's, it's always the hardest. And when you get that email, when you get that um, chance to step up to it, if it's not intimidating, then maybe it's not the right thing for you, but it's always the, the best thing for you is always sometimes the most intimidating thing. I know I've gotten these emails of opportunities and I always read them like, I'm not the person for that. That's like always my first response to myself. It's like, I'm not qualified for that. I don't think that I can do that. Um, they're looking for someone much smarter, someone, you, and the, it was people in my community that I knew that I lived with. I was like, this person would be so much better, be so much smarter. But the difference was I just applied to it and they didn't. And that could be the difference between you getting it and you not getting it. I have a long list of failures that uh, probably out totally longer than my successes, but it just it makes the success the successes much better. And um, just it's just taking that first step and doing it whether you think that you're fit for it or not. Um, so they, it's a lot of times you read it and you think it's not me, but it, it definitely could be. Well, thanks for sharing that. And it, it, like you said, you know, just sharing your point of the self doubt that sometimes that voice is in your head telling you, oh no, there's. Other people might be more qualified or anything, but yet you still took the step and look at where you are today. So that that just says a lot. And we really appreciate you sharing that with others. Um, and then Jasmine, back to you. We have a question from Carla Olivares from Veracruz, Mexico. And she would like to know, when you have multiple areas of interest in your field as an undergrad, how was your journey to decide <laughs> one specific topic to start your research? So with me, Although I had multiple interests, I wanted the research, whoever said yes to me was where I was going to carry out my research or any shadowing opportunities. Because in order to get where you really want, sometimes you have to start somewhere small or somewhere where it may not be your highest interest, but it'll get your foot in the door. So after that, I began to be able to be uh, more choicey. I could choose things because I'd already had that preliminary research done and experience. So it was more so identifying a field where you can learn and then deciding, okay, this is what I would really like to do. Oh, great advice. Thank you. All right. Well, to our Reyes participants, thank you for submitting your questions. That is all the time we have today. But we do want to thank again all of our wonderful panelists, as well as Dr. Metzger and um, Dr. Hill. Thank you for being with us today. We also want to thank our Reyes participants for tuning in. And I just want to remind you that tomorrow at 1 p.m., Dr. Alan Mecca is going to be presenting Understanding Cultural Change Among Immigrant Families. And we hope to see you then. I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye, everyone.